DG Lightline. All right. Good okay. afternoon and uh, welcome to a very special Facebook Live edition of Mind Matters. We are with our very, very good friend, uh, Dr. Joel. How are you feeling, Dr. Joel? Oops. Hi, guys. I'm doing Is he frozen? Good. Thanks for having or me. Or am I again. frozen? Oh, no, skip that. <laughs> I think Bella's frozen. Oh, no. We're having internet issues. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Joel, you feeling good? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me again, guys. All right. So this is something that we've done uh, previously, and uh, we're going to try it out yep. doing this uh, on Facebook Live. So if you have any questions for Dr. Joel, uh, anything about yep. um, mental health issues, mental disorders that you know you're going through or someone else is going through, please comment, and uh, Dr. Joel will jump right on it. Sure. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel. This is like our first ever Facebook Live with you. We've done mm -hmm. similar Facebook Live with Dr. Rajbans, uh, yep. touching on medical questions. But with Dr. Joel Lowe, of course, he is a uh, clinical psychologist. So you can ask him any kind of mental health questions that you might have. And he will answer it straight here. Uh, it's just like a free consultation. So why not, right? Just send us a message. Um, on the comment section below, and we will read it out for Dr. Joel to answer. Yeah. And uh, maybe we should kick start with some of the questions that we've actually received from the DG Lightline, which I have uh, in my hands right now. Yeah, the um, number is, by the way, if you're going to get in touch via the DG Lightline, 016-510-8888. Okay, um, this question is from Elvin Chong. Hi, Dr. Joel. I've been feeling a high level of stress after... Uh, with my company has asked us to go back to work in the office. Yeah. You know, I've been working from home for the past mm -hmm. few weeks because of the MCO, but I'm feeling very uneasy that I'll contract the virus. Am I being mm. irrational or is mm. this some sort of a PTSD that I'm experiencing, <laughs> post-traumatic right. stress disorder? Right, right. Uh, was it Elvin? Was it was it yes, Elvin. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's PTSD yet. Right, um, I, but I think it's it's something that you know. Um, I think a lot of people will be looking at or potentially contracting moving forward, especially if you're a frontline worker or you know those people who are working with uh, uh, patients and stuff like that. But that aside, I don't think you're there yet. But I think your anxiety is quite um, expected, lah. Right? Um, given the fact that this coronavirus has so many uncertainties, there's still so many question marks we just cannot answer, right? Um, like for example, is there going to be a vaccine? Will we ever be properly protected against it? We have no ideas, right? So I think it's only normal for you and a lot of other people out there to to worry and wonder, right? Um, is it safe for me to go back out to work, right? And I think it's it's a really difficult uh, question to ask because you've got to balance between, you know, um, the, the financial implications of not going back to work and staying safe, right? And how many of us are able to do that in the long run? I mean, most of us can't, in that sense, right? And so we have to go back. It's, it's, a, it's a necessity. It's something that we have to do, right? Uh, but at the same time, then what do we do with these worries that we have, you know? So I think a lot of times it's it's almost and if you think about it as an analogy, like it's really about um, managing our anxiety, right? The reason why the coronavirus and everything associated with it is so um, significant in life right now is because it's something we hear about it every day and every second. You turn on the TV, we hear about it. You mm -hmm. go on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, we hear about it. So it's very prevalent in our heads, right? But I think I have this feeling that if given enough time, maybe in like what three months, six months down the line, towards the end of the year, it's gonna be it's gonna come to a point where it starts to um, ebb a little bit, right? So the anxiety is still gonna be there, but it's not gonna be so in your face, right? So it's something we have to live with, something we have to be careful about, but it's gonna be like part of our daily lives, like, in that sense, like, right? So I think um, what to manage it right now, uh, what you can do is to make sure that you take all the safety precautions that you can, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, and things like that, yeah. But uh, keep in mind that, you know, um, you're doing everything that you can to protect yourself, right? And that's the, the, the minimum, that's the best you can ask for already in that sense, right? And as long as you do that, then you think should be okay, right? Um, but how, if, how about if it's stress from going yeah. back to the office because they've been yeah. working from home for so many weeks, you know? Yeah. So I think uh, uh, we need to partial out to see whether it's the stress because I have to go back to work and mingle with everybody else and potentially contract the virus, or is it a work-related stress, right? And I think it's important for us to uh, split the two because how you deal with it, how you manage it, is going to be different in that sense, right? If it's the co uh, uh, COVID-related kind of stress, then okay, these are the things that we can do about it. If it's work stress, you know, how is it any different from what you've been doing uh, at home or in the past before the lockdown happened? 
then mm. it, it, once you break it down like that, it becomes more bite-sized, more manageable. Then it's easier for you to handle the stresses that you feel and experience. Mm. But does it is it worse? For, I mean, for if you're going back to the office and you have now a family to think about that you're the yep. going to bring it back home, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that that is a big stressor, right? especially if your family consists of like elderly, those with really high risk kind of populations, right? Um, again, it comes back to the early question I said, like you know, what are you? What is more sustainable, right? I mean, yes, mm. we want to make sure that they're safe and, and they they don't get sick and things like that, right? But at the same time, if we don't work for three months, six months, nine months, if we quit our jobs, right? What happens then? Then financial problems are going to be another stressor, right? Mm. So we have to decide for ourselves what's the lesser of two evils here, like, in that sense, like, right? If yes. if you can tahan, then okay, then by all means, then maybe quitting for now and waiting for things to settle might be an option. But if it's really not, then do we need another stressor in our lives or not? So it's a balancing kind of thing, like, and it's no right answer. It's right for you, like in that sense, like different for everybody else, like. Yeah. Well, um, Steve Yap has a question from <laughs> our Facebook Live. Uh, is there a lot of cases of DID, dissociative identity disorders yep. here in Malaysia? Yep. Brilliant question. Um, I've been doing this for, what, 10 years now, I think, about 10 years, right? Um, I've never encountered a case of DID in my life before. And uh, just, just uh, a quick uh, a lesson on DID. DID yeah. is basically, the old name is split personality disorder, right? Now we call it dissociative mm-hmm. okay. identity disorder. So if you guys seen the movie uh, Identity, that's a brilliant movie, by the way, and it really depicts what DID is all about. So it's basically what happens is that this person will have multiple personalities that come up in different situations. So let's say they are threatened, like someone is threatening them or they feel very angry, they might have a persona that's either male or female or what have you uh, that comes up and protects this person or is more fragile, or more emotional, more kid-like, for example, right? And it switches from time to time. The key distinguishing factor from DID and someone who has um, very strong emotional reactions is that when someone who has DID, when they switch, um, so let's say my main character is Joel and I've got a personality called Jovina, let's say, for example. Right? Um, Joel won't know what Jovina is doing and vice versa, more often than not. After the fact, then yes, then they can communicate and they can share information, right? But oftentimes, they, there is this, this distinction that the Joel might not know what Jovina is doing or mm. Joel might be able to see what Jovina is doing but have no ability to control what's happening in that sense, right? So in my 10 years so far, I've not seen anybody who has had it. Um, in my center, for example, I've had, we've had probably one person, uh, we confirmed the ID, who's actually come in in the past six years. Um, amongst my colleagues, I probably have two others, so three in total in 10 years, right? So it's really not the most common thing in the world. Um, and not in Malaysia anyway, right? And in worldwide, so it's not the most common uh, disorder, right? So it's quite rare, right? yeah. How do, uh, you said confirm that it's the ID. How do you <coughs> confirm this? So what happened with the one in our center was that um, the client started switching in the center itself, right? So while they are with our consultant, they're having conversation, and then um, the client switched, and it switched a couple of times as well. So that's how we will confirm it, right? Um, yeah, so that's that's that one confirmed uh, episode that we had so far. Mm. And okay. Because I, I, I watched this, okay, I know it's a movie, and it, it, mm-hmm. it may be different, but there's a movie by M. Night Shyamalan that it's, it's called Switch. Where yep, the yep. person who goes into another, um, you said character, right, mm. um, has a slight physical change to their mm. mannerisms as well. Mm. Is is that fiction or is that real? Uh, that's it's it's fictionalized to an extent, like. So sometimes you do see people that when they do have their personality switches, they do change their mannerisms like, more, than, more often than not. Like, right? So someone who is more aggressive, for example, you see a change in their posture, the way they, they walk, for example, their, their bodily movements and things like that. And then sometimes clients, when they switch to a more childlike kind of persona, they, they do shrink in. Like, they do a very childlike, very <coughs> uh, uh, baby-like kind of gestures, for example. So it's more that than the actual physical, like transformed, incredible, how kind of real physical yeah. in your face kind of gestures. <laughs> yeah. It's not like that, like, right? Okay. But it's more mannerisms and the way you carry yourself, like, but um, the lack of diagnosis, is it because there is a lack of knowledge or an awareness of this disorder? Or do you yeah. think that this is just a very rare disorder? Um, I, for in, Especially in Malaysia, I don't know what the answer is. My gut feeling that is this, it's a very rare disorder. And the reason why I say that is because it's so, sen- it's so sensational. It's so 
in your face when a person switches personalities, right? Mm. I would think that if that was happening to quite some regularity that you would go in for help or someone would send you for help, right? So if it was happening that often, we'll see a lot more cases, I think, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. as subtle, like let's say, for example, someone with um, major depressive disorder, right? Because sometimes it's hard to distinguish between that and being sad, right? So it's quite, depression can be quite subtle. The idea is not, it's not one of those like in your faces kind of disorders. Like. So I assume that if there was a lot, we would have seen a lot more cases come in. So my assumption, uh, my gut feeling is that it's a rare disorder like, mm-hmm. in Malaysia at least. Like. Yeah, speaking about that, Steve Yap came back with another question. Uh, is it possible that most Malaysians actually believe that it is, they are possessed by a demon instead, mm-hmm. you know, instead of treating it as the ID? The ID, yeah. Um, for this one, we actually do get quite a bit, but uh, typically when, they, when demonic possession is suggested or is talked about, more often than not, it's uh, schizophrenia that we would talk, uh, probably roll out first. Right. Okay. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Because with DID, um, uh, one thing about DID is that you could have multiple personalities. Uh, so that's one big tell uh, that it's a DID, right? Uh, but let's say it's just one voice, one persona, or whatever it is, then we probably consider schizophrenia as well. So maybe it's uh, because of the psychic break, that, the psychotic break that you have, you feel that there's someone talking to you or someone controlling you, for example. So we would consider schizophrenia uh, first, lah, right? And if let's say that doesn't fit in, then we might want to consider DID or something else. Lah. But it needs to be a trigger, right? At some point, something highly stressful that happens and then this happens? Or is it just when they were young and it just happens naturally? So with schizophrenia, uh, typical, the most typical manifestations of it, lah, right? <clears throat> Happens when someone's about 18 years old, right? Um, so that's 18 to 21. Uh, that's usually the age range when it happens, uh, right? You do have very rare instances where it happens when the, the, the client is really young. Like, I think I've read of maybe one person in my life, like not in Malaysia, but just in, in worldwide, right? Of a kid who was six who had schizophrenia, I think. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's the really rare one, right? So, but later on in life, there, uh, there is that possibility like, where something so traumatic or so incredibly insane happens that you have that psychotic break and then you you become schizophrenic after that. Like. But typically, the most common ones that happen usually about 18 to 21, that's when you start hearing the voices and hallucinations and delusions and all that. Like. And then it becomes but the a ID? Lifelong, uh, the ID is less well-known, right? So, the again, typically, if I'm not mistaken, it also happens about that same age time, about 18 to 21, right? So, at, in, and usually people with DID, a lot of times you, you speak to them, right? They've got a very long history of abuse, trauma, traumatic events, and things like that. So, these personas are almost like guardians, like, in that sense, like, right. potentially. Right? Um, and then it develops over time, right? For so it to happen as a... Hmm, sorry? It's always about when you're about to become an adult that things happen yeah yeah well for these two especially like usually the more severe psychotic break kind of thing kind of disorders then usually happens around that age group right uh, but are, they, are these people born with this disorder already <clears throat> and it only manifests itself when they're 18 yeah. to 21 so what we find is that people with schizophrenia right um the if there's someone in your family with schizophrenia or history of schizophrenia you are 50 percent uh, more likely to have it yourself right so they would argue, 50%, yeah. So okay. they would argue that there is some genetic or biological component to it, right? <clears throat> but then again, you do twin studies, right? You get those um, uh, biological identical twins, right? You do some find situations where one twin gets the schizophrenia and the other twin doesn't, right? Then genetically, they're supposed to be identical as well, right? So it's really no real or concrete way to tell whether it's biological or not, whether it's psychological or it's a social stressor, it's hard to tell. Uh. But usually it's a perfect storm of everything combined together and then that's mm. what happens. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, if you just join us, we're uh, doing a free clinic with Dr. Joel Lowe, who is a clinical psychologist and director at the Mind Psychological Services and Training. So he's here today to answer any questions you might have on mental health issues or mental disorders. And... Uh, this is our free clinic for Mind Matters. And if you are not, if you are shy to put in your comments here on Facebook, you can actually uh, send us a message as well. I have the DG Light line right here. The number is 016-510-8888. You can remain anonymous if you'd like to um, and ask the question to our DG Light line as well. Send the question to our DG Light line if you no- don't want to put it in the comment section below. And um, this is a pretty interesting question from Jenny that I found on our DG Lightline. Um, She said that she noticed recently that a girlfriend of hers, 
she's happy one minute and then a few minutes later she gets really quiet and seems to want to be by herself only mm -hmm. uh and her mood swings happen very very often mm. and she's wondering if it's anything more than pms you know women mm. we have mood swings and <laughs> during pms and all that so right, is it right. can it be anything more than pms like i've heard yeah. of bipolar with people mm. with mood swings right yeah yeah uh be before i answer that question but a uh, fun fact right um pms is actually a diagnosable disorder now <laughs> uh, really <laughs> yeah, what does that um, mean <laughs> So, we, so for clinical psychologists and counselors, right? Um, we have got this. Uh, it's basically our bible. Uh, right? We call it the DSM, the Diagnostic uh, and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. So it's this giant, like, um, phone book kind of uh, uh, dictionary, basically, right? Where it lists okay. all the symptoms and disorders that that exist in the world. So that way, if I diagnose someone with depression, for example, someone in the states will know what I'm talking about. It's the same kind mm -hmm. of symptoms and criteria. Mm -hmm. right? So the most recent iteration um, that we have, uh, that we had, it was the DSM five, and they included PMS into the the the, the DSM. So meaning DSM is actually a mental disorder, right? Um, but um, that has a lot of um, political, financial, and insurance involved reasons why it's there, like, right? So that people could claim for insurance and claim for uh, for time off and things like that. Like. That's why mm. PMS is there for whatever reason. But anyway, back to the question. Um, it could be just PMS, right? Um, but I think what's important is for us to find the patterns here, right? So if it happens around the time of your your period, for example, then yes, it's more likely to be PMS before and after and things like that, right? But if it's something that's happening more random, right? It, um, there's no real uh, pattern to it, lah. Then I probably would be a bit more concerned because then we have to wondering, you have to wonder why there's so much in, uh, imbalance or changes that's happening, right? One possibility could be hormonal, right? That means your body is going through some kind of hormonal changes, right? Or some kind of biochemical changes as well. So, like people with thyroid, hypothyroid, or hypothyroid, sometimes um, they can have um, fluctuations in their mood, right? So sometimes they can come for depression, but we find out there's something wrong with the thyroid. They get that fixed, and then they, they go back to normal. They're more balanced out emotionally. So that's one consideration. Um, another consideration is that perhaps there is some kind of stressor in your life that you are handling, right? By and large. But it takes up so much of your brain power and the resources, mental faculties that you have, that it's all being put there to just try and control the situation. That when then anything little tiny little thing that happens, you just flare up because there's nothing left to 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 handle it or take care of it, so to speak, right? So that could be another thing to to consider as well. Now, Bell, you said bipolar. Bipolar um, might be possible, but I I again we're looking at patterns here, right? Mm. Now, bipolar is basically when someone fluctuates between depression, so you have a very, very low mood, you feel very down and suicidal sometimes, very depressed, that kind of thing, right? And the opposite, the high part, is when you're manic, right? So manic basically means that you feel so good that you can do anything that you want, right? So when I, when I say anything that you want, it can be extreme as things like, uh, for example, um, as mild as thinking, okay, if I ask anyone out right now, the hottest girl in class, hottest girl in my office, they're going to say yes to... Even more extreme things like I can buy a Ferrari with my credit card. I can buy two condos and a house. Not an issue. Oh in the same wow! Month. Right? Yeah, and not logical. All oh, right. Okay. Correct. Correct. It's almost irrational, even right. And sometimes to a point where you know, if I jump off the roof, I think I can fly. Those are like really extreme. Oh kind wow! Of the things are yeah. So we've got different ranges. Like, so there's bipolar one and two. Bipolar one is the more extreme one. Bipolar two is the asking anybody out and they're gonna say yes kind of thing. So it's a milder version of that. Mm. Right? <laughs> but you're naturally handsome, JD. So I think that's <laughs> <understandable>, right? <laughs> um, I'm not so, uh, <laughs> so back to the question that Bell raises now. It could be bipolar, but it depends on the how often the fluctuations are happening, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a day-to-day -day kind of thing, then it's less likely to be bipolar because bipolar typically takes quite a long time to 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 swing in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. So a good way to look at bipolar is like it's a pendulum, right? And you're swinging um, back and forth. So you go all the way, you're high, let's say, for example. It takes time for you to come down from that high and then become depressed again and so on and so forth. Like. So it's something that's happening on day-to-day -day basis. It could be rapid cycling, but um, again, you have to check out and see. But if it's happening over a span of a few months, then it is possible that it's bipolar in that sense, right? Oh, so um, bipolar is not like you ex you experience the highs and the lows just in a short period of time. It takes time no, no. to yeah, switch. Time. Yeah. yeah, even rapid switching bipolar, you're talking about days and weeks, not like hours kind of thing, right? Um, very um, rare in hours, right? More typically, it's like a matter of uh, months, right? So a few months here, a few months there. Mm. Uh, it is oh. possible, but you need to check on it. Like I said, I'll find out what the patterns are, and then we can better discern what the possibilities are. Mm. 
Yeah, interesting. So Jenny's uh, friend might just be having some hormonal issues if she is also, yeah. happy one minute, you know, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. sad the next. Correct, but is correct. it like oh. even before then, uh, are these people, and I'm just asking from a, a very generic point of view, right? Do these people generally have bad tempers and they have highs and lows even when they're not having their their periods? Uh, not not typically though. Um, because you do see people individuals who are like the most mild manner, the sweetest things on earth, and then when uh, it's that time of the month, they they, they become Godzilla, right? Um, oh, right. And, it, and, <laughs> okay. and, and to be fair, there are guys who actually go through similar things as well, right? So there's male menopause, for example, and there are times of the month where males do tend to rage a bit more than than usual. Yeah. Wait, wait. Happen as well. Go back. Men go through <laughs> menopause as well. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. Male menopause, like so, we reach a certain age where our biochemistry goes. Uh, KYO, right? And we do have changes like in the way we react, the way we do things, for example. And it can happen. It's not as common as females do because females at, at the age, certain age, they go through very significant biological changes in their, their bodies, right? Guys don't, but it does. It can happen as well. Like. It's not as common, but it can happen as well. Like. Mm. Oh my so, God. <laughs> <laughs> so the other question is not necessary that they're naturally very angry people. No, mm. uh, it's not necessary. Mm. It's quite a random line that time. Mm. Okay. All right. Wow. Now let's get back to the questions from our listeners. Um, Moose Moose Ahmad says, since PKP, I feel so moody. Why? Mm. I used to cycle <laughs> early in the morning before PKP, yeah. at least <clears throat> after five May. Mm. Uh, a little bit happy. Yep, means yep. uh the, this whole time during the MCO CMCO he's been feeling yep. moody, yep, yep. and exercising has not helped that much I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh okay so if he I I guess okay the the question there right um if he he used to cycle in the past and then suddenly because of the PKP he couldn't right. Um, that will explain why you've been moody quite a bit, right? Because when you exercise, your body just releases a lot of happy hormones, makes you feel happy, mm-hmm. good about yourself, endorphins and things like that. So when suddenly you go from that to nothing, it's quite a big shock to the system, right? And your body does tend to crave that kind of, uh, same kind of surge in the good feelings that you have. So it's probably more explains why you've been moody. Now, if post uh, PKP, now that we've gone to the conditional MCO and you're wondering how come it hasn't improved, it takes time, right? Because your body needs to get used to the new uh, changes, the new parameters and things like that, right? Uh, before you feel good about it. So I think it's important for you to be consistent, right? So don't do it like one day, two days. It doesn't change anything. Okay, that's it. Scrap it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, be consistent. Try it out for a week or two weeks and see how that goes, right? Um, if you're lucky, then things go back to normal, then great, right? But it's also possible that your body also changes with the times, right? It's it's like you know, last time in high school and college, we could stay up to three, four o'clock typing, banging up an assignment that's due the next day, no problem. Next day, I can still go and party, no issue, right? I, I do that now, and I'm a zombie for the next three days, right? I, I cannot do that anymore, right? So it's also possible that uh, during this MCO, your body has changed biologically as well. That you need a different source of uh, of, of adrenaline or endorphins or whatnot, right? Mm. So if those same activities don't work out anymore, you might want to try something a bit different or something new just to see whether you can spice things up a bit or not. Mm-hmm. All right, hopefully that helps. All right. Does exercising really help with releasing all these, like like you said, happy hormones? Uh, this is the yeah. question that Steve Yap has asked as well. Yeah. yeah. Can yeah, that be does. like the treatment for mm-hmm. for most mental health issues? Uh, not most, but quite a few actually. So, like for example, with depression, right, mild, really mild depression, right. Um, sometimes you don't need medication or therapy. You just go out for a good long run or whatever physical activity that you enjoy, and that's usually quite a good uh, curative uh, step to your depression. Right, you feel much better after that, and you feel uh, much less down after that. Right? And it is proven right, that you know if you take care of your body, you are less likely to have bouts of depression in that sense. Right? So even in our therapy, for example, we regularly encourage our clients to be active uh, physically, right? So either to work out or exercise regimes or what have you, like, right? Just to stay as, as physically um, uh, moving as possible, as active as you can be, right? Actually quite useful. Yeah, very helpful. Is that why athletes, mm-hmm. because they're so used to such a high <laughs> level of adrenaline and possibly endorphins, mm-hmm. they, they, they exercise constantly, even on a re- daily basis, and then when something like a lockdown happens, they mm. experience a crash. And then you keep hearing about athletes going through depressive states and everything. Yep. Is it because yep. their levels are so much higher than ours? That could be one reason. Um, I was reading something about uh, those, uh, what do you call it, um, 
like, extreme runners, those people who run like you know hundred miles yeah, yeah. and then something really crazy ones, right? Ultra, um, ultra, and, ultra, yeah. ultra marathoners, the, Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's the one. Um, and I was reading something about how the, uh, similar to what JD is saying, right? That um, when they don't do those ultra runs, right, they feel something's wrong, something's off with their bodies and things like that. They need to go on those kind of really long track runs. And I think it boils down to the fact that your body gets used to different parameters or different states of mm -hmm. mind that you're, you're in, right? And then that's why, like, for example, um, and that's what a lot of drug addicts go through as well, for example, right? They take that one small kit, for example, of drugs to start off with and they feel really good about it. Then the next time they need a little bit more, they need a little bit more because you get that you get used to the high, right? So uh, sometimes with athletes and all that, when they have they're so used to that kind of high, and when they don't have it anymore, then the crash is quite significant in that sense, right? Um, but that is not to say that if you're exercising a lot, you're not going to get depressed. You can get depressed. There are lots of history of of, of people, for footballers, for example, who have been depressed before as well. It's just that it helps, lah, right? It is more preventive, lah, right? But it's not a cure or or, or uh, vaccine against like depression, so to speak. Like. Mm. Oh, it's like Belle and Durians. Like the first time she had Durians was great. Now she has to have more and more Durians <laughs> to get it high again. More expensive ones so that they right, taste right, better, right? right? right. Yeah. <laughs> You're always looking for the best Durian out there. Correct, 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 correct. <laughs> now we, we receive another question from Kijang uh, K K L, I think, or yeah. Kijang Ki. Um, during depression awareness campaigns, a lot of depression signs were distributed to educate people. Mm. This leads to some cases where a person having minor symptoms of distress, loneliness, etc. believes mm. they're experiencing depression without proper diagnosis. Mm. Does this or will this eventually develop into a mental health problem? You know, please elaborate as uh, many are misunderstood by this. Uh, and it seems to be quite serious. Mm, so mm. he's also added that several several of his friends who once had a strong personality before now turns out to be like fragile and and yeah. because they think they have depression. Yeah, I think this is actually quite a it's it's a problem definitely right. So not only uh, with this uh, materials that are being shared out, uh, Google is a big perpetrator of this as well, right? You go on Google, you type in your symptoms, you either have depression or suddenly you've got like. I don't know, uh, uh, the rarest form of cancer yeah. in the world or you've got a mole and become, you know, and, yeah. and that's, that's, that's Google for you because, mm -hmm. I mean, Google is a great repository of information, right? But it's not a doctor, right? And there's a lot of to say about things about clinical judgment, for example, you know, um, being able to take in all the different parameters and the facets that you may even haven't considered before. And that's why you need to see a doctor or a psychologist to get diagnosed, like, right? So Kijang, to answer your question, I think it is an issue, especially when, I think the issue isn't so much about the diagnosing. Because that's something that um, you got a checklist, you can find out. I think it's what you do with the diagnosis, right? So if, let's say, for example, I do a checklist and I get things that, okay, I'm scoring very high on depressive traits and I think I might be quite down. If I choose to make that my label and I rubber stamp it on my head, I'm a depressed person, then that's the problem, right? Because mm -hmm. then I become depression, right? As opposed to someone who, who does a checklist and say, oh, look, I'm feeling a bit down and my score's telling me I'm feeling a bit low. Maybe I should go work out more. I should go out and do something fun or hang out with my friends, for example. And if your choice is to do that, then then great, fantastic. And then the, the, the inventory or the measure has done its job in that sense. Mm. Right? So in terms of your friends who've had a massive change in personality and they're feeling much more fragile and a bit more uh, uncertain now, right? Kijang, I think it's really important that you encourage them to seek uh, proper diagnosis and proper assistance from someone because they might not even have uh, severe depression. Right? It might be something yeah. that's mild, but they make it severe. They, they believe it to be severe. And then it becomes their personality or their, their identity. Like, and that's a big, big issue. Like. So even in our yeah. field, for example... Yeah. Sorry, Bill. Go ahead, go ahead, Joe. Go okay. ahead. In your field. Even for me, yeah. Even for me, for example, I try to diagnose a person only when it needs to be diagnosed, right? So like, let's say it's for, for work purposes or school purposes, then yeah, okay, then we need to diagnose. We'll diagnose you, right? But if not, then we try not to because if my concern is that it becomes a label that you apply to yourself yeah. and that's you forever and we don't want that as well. I rather That's look at okay, this is the to, problems that you have and yeah. fix it. Mm. That's it's what I wanted problem. to add. I feel like depression mm. is a label that's been thrown around too yeah. Too quickly mm -hmm. nowadays, yeah, like yeah. you, you don't have motivation to go to work. You're depressed, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. You're lonely and you feel sad all the time. You're depressed, but sometimes it's just life, you know. Life, yeah. life yeah. can throw you some of these curveballs, and, and you get it's a bit low sometimes. But the... It's not depression. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people just uh, literally just oh, I've got depression. It's yeah. not because some people who really have depression right. really need the help. You just you just kind of like 
um, diluting how bad the problem really is. Yeah. Yeah. Case, yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly right. Mm. Yeah. Very right. So wow. get it diagnosed. If you really think you yeah. have depression, get it diagnosed we'll properly it. from a psychologist. Yeah, but I don't know about, about like during depression awareness campaigns. I mean, like, is the mm-hmm. mind really that easily swayed? I mean, like, just by a suggestion. Oh, yeah. That you see, yeah, yeah. Really? Um, you guys know what placebos are, right? Like when you take yeah, the yeah. pills and things like that. Exactly the same effect, right? Just the thought of me taking this pill and I'm going to get better can sometimes make someone better. Right, um, and you see this in from mental health, like depression, for example, all the way to genuine medical concerns and problems, for example, and that's how powerful the mind is. That like we really do make it real, right? Um, have you guys heard of? Uh, I can't remember the word for it, but it's basically pregnancy by proxy or, or false oh, pregnancy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we think we are pregnant, we want to be pregnant so much, we actually force our bodies to go through the biological changes of pregnancy. So we start lactating. Well, not we, but females like, start lactating. Um, you know, uh, the body starts, you stop having a period, for example, and you look like you're getting pregnant. Um, but you're yeah, not pregnant. Kind of, you're not, you're not. Right? It's all in the mind. It's how powerful the mind can be. You that happens it in so humans? Like it's it's yeah, a very, it it's happen. an animal, it happens a lot in animals. Animals, yeah, correct. Humans, it happens as well. It's not the most common, right? But it can happen, right? Um, wow. Males also, we also hear uh, pregnant, uh, pregnancy by proxy. Right? So males start like dating, right? They can breastfeed, right? For some crazy reason. Or they might have um, like cravings, cravings. For, for. I've heard yes, of that, cravings. like cravings. Yeah, correct, correct. When their we, wife is pregnant, the men have craving as well. Yeah, but men yeah, don't lactate. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so, because lactation is uh, because all of us are born. Fe- uh, no, we start off as females first, right? So when the Y chromosome kicks in, then we become what? male. <laughs> we, Okay, so JD's, JD, like, quick, JD's in all sorts of shocks today. <laughs> yeah, quick, 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 quick bio lesson. First, there's men menopause, and now there's men lactating. Mm, what is right, going right. on here? <laughs> so, um, when we when when sperm meets egg, right? All of us are actually female first to begin with. And yeah. Then when the Y chromosome kicks in, that's when our uh, we become male, right? So that's when our penis will, will draw the testicles will drop and all those kind of things, right? Um, so biologically, <laughs> technically speaking, we all have our roots in being female, right? So that's why sometimes in very rare instances it can happen, right? Um, there's also tribes in in parts of the world where people do at the age, certain age when they hit puberty, they've been female all their life. Suddenly at the age of 12, 13, they become male. And suddenly their their penis drops, their testicles drop, they become male, right? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the wonderful world of wow. Humans, I guess. Today's session is just <laughs> wild, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, there is a question from Prem Kumar and also uh, Faisal from our Facebook um, DMs. Um, this is more about working from home. So Prem Kumar has this question. How do you manage working from home when we have a noisy family around and not mm. much personal space to move around? And yeah. Faisal's question about working from home is also about... Um, how do I tell my wife that I'm working from home? She always thinks that just because I'm at home, she asks me to do chores, like, you know, open a bottle, <laughs> right, 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 uh, right. feed the cats, watch our kids, you know, yep, and then yep, I yep. end up having to work five or six hours longer because I spend mm. time doing household chores. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not sure if there are, there are <laughs> mental health issues to begin with, but I mean, it right. is an issue. Yes, um, yeah. For people who are not used to working from home. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it can it can potentially be a mental health issue because it's 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 just crazy, right? Having to juggle being at home and working at the same time. So having to switch between being a dad, a husband, or a wife and a mom, for example, to to being a high powered CEO or receptionist or secretary, whatever whatever it is that you do like that sense. It's it's really jarring in that sense. And I think as good as our minds are able to uh, oscillate between the different roles that we play. We need time, right? That's why I think sometimes the commutes to and fro work are so brilliant because it gives us time to prepare for the next role that we're going to take on when we get back home, when we get to work, right? It's almost like a transition phase, like transformation kind of thing, right? Hmm. But when we're working from home, because we don't ever have that option, it's just like that, like that, like that. It can be very jarring to our system. And and I've heard of a lot of people with very frayed nerves, for example, and they get very snappy and very agitated because of all these frustrations that they're feeling, right? So to answer both your questions, right? Um, I think this is uh, some conversations that you need to have with your family, like helping them to understand that, yes, I'm physically at home, but I've got responsibilities that I need to fulfill from work, for example. 
And I think to be fair or to, to balance out the thing a little bit, what I've suggested to clients before is to have a, a literal timetable kind of thing so that everyone is can see and what's going on, right? So like from the hours between 9 and 11.30, this is my work time, right? 11.30 onwards, I will help with lunch, for example, or help with the kids while you prepare lunch or whatever it is, right? And then after lunchtime, then I can come back to work again and this is my work hours. And that's actually a really good life hack to have because then everyone is clear, okay, I'm at work now, right? If you can manage, carve out a small space for yourself, either in a room or a little corner on the dining table, for example, so when you're working, that's literally my work time, my workplace, right? So that people don't come in or they don't come and interrupt, right? Like this now, this this place here that I'm in right now is my my workplace, or if I'm not working, then it's my daughter's uh, classroom, right? So we know that whoever's in here, it's, it's study time, right? So we don't muck around, we don't play, or we don't uh, interrupt one another, like that sense. So that's another really good way to um, partial out the differences, like the different roles that you have, like, right? So Prem and uh, Faisal, hopefully that helps, right? Um, again. I think there has to be some margin of flexibility, like, unfortunately, that like, it is what it is. Like. But as much as we can, if we can set those boundaries a bit clearer, then it's going to be better for us in the long run. Is it an issue, and I'm trying to not be sexist about things here, but men and women, women tend to be able to multitask a lot better than men. Yeah. And yeah. is that like they just automatically assume that men can be able to do this? So yes, I am working, but yeah. while you're at it, can you cut the vegetables and iron some clothes as well? <laughs> they, they, they automatically assume, but we we men can uh, do that. Is that is that safe? Is that right to say? Um, okay. So just to break it down a little bit, right? It is proven, uh, at least for as far as I know, that women do multitask better than men, right? That's that's a that's a fact. Um, there mm -hmm. was a study done by the U.S. Army, I think, if I'm not mistaken, where the 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 male and female fighter pilots and they found that the female fighter pilots could track more enemies at the same time rather than males. Males like okay, I go enemy, I'm gonna take the fellow down and get shot from behind. Females right. no, they they can keep track of multiple things. So that it's a proven fact. Hmm. Now whether or not that fact is taken and and placed upon males, like, so if I can do it, you can do it too. I hmm. I don't know. I think it's a case to case kind of scenario. Some people would probably think like that. Um, other people like my wife, for example, has given up on me multitasking, so she knows not to try. <laughs> Right, so I think it's definitely a case to case kind of scenario. Like yeah. Some people would mm -hmm. do what you said, JD, some people won't. Mm. Yeah, but well, I think a lot, of women, a lot of women have been working from home from mm -hmm. you know from the beginning of times, and yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like it, we are more adapted to it not only because we can multitask, it's because we. Even sometimes when we work full time outside, when we come home, we still have to work. You know, we yeah, still have yeah, to totally. clean the house. We still have to cook for the kids and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. I think if men who have done this uh, on mm. a longer basis, or like they've come home and helped with the housework and helped mm. with the cooking mm. and all that, they will be able to multitask a bit yeah, better, better as well. Yes, yeah, correct. It's a practice. So it's thing all yeah, it's all in training. You know, you yeah. have to train your husbands <laughs> oh, yeah. to do it. Yes, correct, correct. <laughs> Not just I mean, you know. eventually, if we can lactate, I mean, we can do this as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's well, yeah, what is we can eat like? the baby as well, and we can sleep God. through the night. I'm Wouldn't so, that be great? I'm so distressed <laughs> right now. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right. Let's get to another question that I received on our um, DG Lightline. Um, if you've just joined us, this is the Mind Matters Free Clinic with Dr. Joel Lowe, a clinical psychologist. So, if you have any questions uh, about mental health issues, mental disorders, you can send them to our DG Lightline zero one six five one zero double eight double eight, or you can even leave us a comment down below, and we will answer them for you right here right now and this question comes from Aliza how do I approach my neighbor whose son I suspect is autistic uh, they seem to think he's fine and it's just mm. a face but he's almost ready to go to kindy next year so he's mm. probably about three four years old mm. I don't want to be intrusive but I feel yeah. It is in the best interest of the child. What are the signs to look out for in a young child who might have autism? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Aliza, um, I, I think uh, the usual age range that we usually diagnose uh, kids with um, uh, developmental disorders like autism, for example, it's about three, four, five years old. Uh, because that's when they're starting to go into more formal education settings like kindergarten and play school and things like that. And when you have a point of reference or comparison with other same age peers, then that becomes much more clearer like, that there might be some disruptions or some issues going on, right? So I think uh, these are naturally, 
when your neighbor's kids go to school, I think that's when it will become more obvious to them. Like, I think that's so naturally it's going to happen. Like, I think if it's true that this child has, has autism. Like. That being said, you know, I think we've got to be really careful how we position it because if it, you don't want to offend your neighbor, right? Because mm. obviously saying your child has autism, it's a, it's a big comment or big uh, accusation to, to, to throw at them like, in that sense, right? But at the same time, it's also possible that, you know, it's a red herring like, because there are some kids who, who, let's say they are the only kids at home and now it's a lockdown, they don't really have much social interaction with anybody, right? They can look like they're having autism, autism-like traits because they just haven't learned to socialize, right? Obviously, socializing with peers and socializing with adults are very, very different, right? It can be, it's, it's a different set of uh, skills to have, right? So it's po entirely possible that once uh, this person, this kid gets to school, it irons out, everything's going to be okay, right? So it's, it's something to bear in mind as well. So let's, so to answer your question, Aliza, I think it's a wait and see kind of approach. Let's just wait and see how the child adapts to the school and, and going into school and things like that. And then let's say, the, and, on, and generally speaking, especially in a situation like this, a good time to bring it up is when your neighbors uh, maybe bring it up. Like they say, oh, you know what? Um, let's say baby Jack. Like, right? Jack is struggling in school. You know, something's going on. Um, I wonder what's going on. Then that might be a good time to say, hey, maybe it could be XYZ ABC. Mm -hmm. um, short of that, I probably would suggest you just hang back a little bit more. I would be more cautious about it. Like, unless it's very obvious, like the child is going to get um, hurt or, or, or isolated, alienated or bullied because of it, then yeah, okay. Like. But what are the tell you time? Yeah. yeah. So with autism, I think one of the telltale signs is um, the biggest thing that we look out for is the social interaction, right? So uh, typically, uh, individuals with autism or at least on the autism spectrum, you find that socially they are a bit more awkward like, than usual, like, right? So by awkward, I mean things like, you know, even at a young age, they don't do, they don't uh, make eye contact with you, right? Their, speak, their speech is a bit uh, unique, right? So that means they speak in a very certain, unique kind of way. Um, and also sometimes they might have very... Um, uh, what's the word on you? So very specific interests like dinosaurs or cars, or for example, right? Oh yeah, like, yeah, I, yeah. So they're very specific kind of interests. So when they talk to you, so it's really about that and only that, and they're not interested about anything else, or entertaining other things. Like. So usually these are some of the more um, clearer signs of autism that we look out for, even in very young children. Like. Other things that you can look out for is repetitive behavior. That means, like, let's say when they play with uh, cars, right, um, toy cars and things like that, they have a certain way to line up the cars, like red, orange, blue, yellow cars in a certain way, and every time it has to be that kind of way. And if you mess it up, they will pick it up and they will switch it around, for example. Isn't that just or... being OCD? Sorry? Isn't that just being slightly OCD then? <laughs> it could be, potentially, but again, it's a, we look at it as a pattern, right? So not just that one isolated behavior, but that's just one of the things we look out for. Okay, so if okay. multiple of these things together, then we might want to uh, be, more, be more cautious. But if it's just that alone, then we you know, we'll be more My relaxed. son likes to line his cars up in a straight mm -hmm. line every time he plays with them. He just lines them up yep. in a straight line, but he speaks really well. He maintains mm -hmm. eye contact. He shows social mm -hmm. connection. So... Um, yep, yep. That's fine. So that's, but, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. what I'm wondering is, is it better to diagnose autism earlier mm. on? Can can you yeah. get treatment at a faster mm. rate, which would help with the, yeah. you know, with the autism? Yep, definitely. So the earlier the and studies have shown that the earlier you diagnose someone with autism and get them the right uh, assistance and the right care, right, we are able to help the person develop really good coping strategies and mechanisms so that it's as dis as least disruptive as possible to their lives, like, right? Um, as opposed to people who find out when they're in the older years, like teenagers, for example, and even adults sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and th by that age, a lot of the bad habits or whatever this has been set in, for example, and people find it hard. They, they lose their ability to adapt to different situations. That's going to be much harder, right? Now, when we talk about autism and other developmental disorders, we typically don't talk about treatment or cures like, because it's not something that we could reliably say it can be done. Mm. There are instances where people recover to a point or they get better to a point where it really doesn't disrupt their lives, but there are some traits. But more often than not, it's something that people will live it throughout their lives. Like, right? So we often talk, often talk about management. So when a young child comes in and you're able to catch it early, then we can start teaching the parents as well as the child how to manage the, the, the anxiety about... Uh, and people with autism, they often have a lot of anxiety about changing patterns, changing routines and things like that. So how can we prepare the child for change in routine? How we can we get the child to get used to changes in routine? How can we get them to communicate effectively, for example, and things like that? So the earlier they learn it, so it's going to be less disruptive to their lives. So it's like a domino effect kind of thing, right? So it's less disruptive in their lives in the long run. Mm -hmm. 
So at three, can we already tell if that child has autism and get him diagnosed at three? By, by three, four, three, four, I think four, five would probably be the most common age. By three, you can. But even for me, for example, at age three, I'll be very careful because it's still very, very young and the child is still developing. Right? It could be just that he's a late bloomer, for example. It just takes a bit slower. right? So I think giving time to about four or five, and then that's, that's a good time to start diagnosing with him. Mm. Okay, interesting. Now let's get back to our comments. Um, Munira Ismail said on our work from home topic, it is quite stressful when there seems like there's no boundaries, you know, between mm. working time, you work around the clock as you need to be accessible and to meet the expectations from bosses. Mm, so yep. I think uh, we've, we've spoken about this. It feels like there's yeah. no end to work when yeah. you're working yeah. from home. Like, because... Yep. Yep can be working early in the morning until late at night and still work is not done. <laughs> yep, correct, correct. I think going back to my earlier statement about setting boundaries and, and, and timetables, right? um, I mean, of course, I'm talking about perfect ideal situations here, but whenever that can be done, then it's healthy for everybody involved. Right? So your boss knows that you put in your eight-hour shift and that's the work I've done for today and now I'm going to sign off, for example. And even for you as well, you know, you feel assured that, you know, I've done what I need to do and now I can spend time with the family and do what I need to do, right? Ultimately, this is something that all of us have, have, have had to learn to cope with like, in that sense. Like, and I think it's just going to take us more time to get used to this whole idea. Like. Yeah, I think us in our Asian culture where, you know, we work, we pick up phone, work phone calls in yeah, the middle yeah. of the night, you mm. know, or look at mm. text that comes in at 1, 2 a.m. in the morning mm. in the West, um, you'll be reported to HR already ah, if you yeah, sent yeah. any kind of work emails or oh, that's also after. depend on the industry yeah. though. Like like Bell and I, we're friends mm -hmm. and we message mm -hmm. each other all the time and then we're in, yep. in the groups and we're, we're just talking about stuff. But then yep. we'll go, hey, we can use that for the show. So right. that technically is <laughs> also working, right? So yeah, it's also it's different, yeah. you see. It's different. Mm -hmm. That we, we were chatting and then work came into it yeah. and we are friends. You see, but if it's just your boss yeah. texting you at two a.m. in the morning, say the please get this or... done by tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's different. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> because I read. Um, oh, do we have time? Okay, I actually read this article of this Singaporean actress who went to Par uh, France to yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. And she was reported to HR not once but twice because she sent. First of all, she sent a text to a colleague at eleven p.m. at night mm. asking about work the next day. Yep. And yep. that colleague reported her to HR. Mm. And then the second time around, she sent out a forwarded or an email or a mass email mm. to everyone at like uh, past, past working hours, hours maybe yeah. like 7 or 8 p.m. at night. And she got mm. reported to HR. Yeah. And HR asked her to take two days <laughs> off and have fun. <laughs> wow. She's <laughs> working wow. too hard. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. But in the West, it's true. I mean, even yeah. when I was studying in Australia, um, oh, the Australians, yeah. mm. once it's five o'clock, it's going home, That's whether it. or not yeah. you know, they finish their work or not, you know, yeah. whether the deadline is tomorrow or not. So I think we have to um, adopt or adapt to ourselves to these kinds of guidelines if yeah. we are to work from home. Five yeah. o'clock yeah. cutoff time means no more working. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a balance. Like you got to, you know, obviously we don't want to offend our bosses and things like that. <clears throat> but at the same time, we need to take care of ourselves and make sure that we are okay. La. We, are, we are ready to go the next day and not burnt out and stressed out and things like that. Is that why Joel keeps looking at his watch? Because we're almost at 5 o'clock already. Okay, fine. We'll see <laughs> you later. No, no. I think I'm... I think I'm... I, I, like my, uh, I like the look of myself too much. I keep looking at myself in the, in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have, uh, we have time for questions. So if you have any question with regards to mental health issues or mental disorders, you can ask them here on our comment section. This is our Mind Matters free clinic with Dr. Joel Lowe, who is a clinical psychologist. And uh, Brad uh, sent us a question on our comments. Um, Hi, Dr. Joel. I have been having this problem where I tend to freak out or panic mm. more often when I make many mistakes with work or playing video games and sports. And that tiny mistake tends to affect my mood and performance for an entire day. And I tend mm. to apologize to my bosses and friends a bit too excessively, mm. though the mistake may be little to others, but it feels like I failed the city. Right. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Feel the city. It feels <laughs> like a case of perfectionism gone yeah. wrong, yeah. doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I, I, I I agree with that, Bell. I think it's uh, Bradley. I think it sounds like you've got a lot of uh, very high expectations in yourself, and 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 you want to achieve, lah, right? And everything that you do should be close to, if not is perfect, perfect, lah, in that sense, right? Um, I think it's it's. I mean, a lot of us do have that, right? But I think it's about how we deal with the situations or the the times when we are not perfect, lah, right? If it's a motivating kind of thing, like okay, you know what, I I I screwed up in that game because I missed that pass, and then uh, my my opponent scored a goal, and I want to do better next time. Then great, it's a, it's a motivational kind of thing. But if it's a stick that you used to beat yourself with, like which it sounds like with you, then I think it's something that we need to re-examine, right? Because you know, if it's gonna keep you or make you feel down about it, like in that sense, like right? if it's just one thing in one day, yeah, okay, we can manage. Like, but if it's 10 things in one day, then it's going to cripple anyone that, anybody, like, no matter how strong or how resilient you are, like, right? So I think it's important for you to re-examine and, and see where, why the perfection is there to begin with, right? Why is there a need to be perfect at all times? Right? That's the first question. And second question is, do you need to be perfect or not, right? And sometimes if you give yourself that a bit of a leeway, so like if I'm perfect at work, for example, but I'm okay to be more slack when I'm with my friends or when I'm playing games and things like that, then okay, that's fine. That's more manageable in that sense. I think sometimes we need to pick our battles. Mm-hmm. Like we can't win every single battle that we're in. But in, in a way, um, yeah, culturally, culturally doesn't mm-hmm. it, uh, like, okay, just across the causeway <laughs> to the south, they're known as the very kiasu. <laughs> and culturally, right. you must strive for only the best. If not, uh, mm-hmm. it's you're not good enough and whatnot. Culturally, is there something about how uh, country is or people are that mm. they want to be more perfect than others. They they get more very stressed out when they don't do well compared to mm. others where they're very just you know I'm yeah. cool if I if I don't do as well anyway. Yeah, like Singaporeans versus Australians, for example. Thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But JD has just have a point. Uh, some cultures do um uh, what's the celebrate perfection, right? So like like um like like JD saying the our neighbors down south. There is this element or this tendency to celebrate perfection or greatness or success in that sense, right? And because of that, then naturally it, it kind of settles into our own individual psyches that that's what I need to do as well. That's what I need to try and achieve as well. Compared to, mm-hmm. let's say, like Bell, you were saying Australia, where it's much more laid back, you know, and where we do what we need to survive, and that's fine. That's enough for us, really, right? And again, that settles into our psyche, like, right? So as a society, collectively, there can be different kind of personalities, right? So to speak, like, for each country or culture that we come from. But about what you say is right, lah. Ultimately, it's a personal decision, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone around me is like that. Doesn't mean I have to be like that as well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I and I think that's a personal choice that you need to make, and also you need to be comfortable with the repercussions of it, lah. Right? If you're in a country or society that celebrates greatness or celebrates success, and you take the opposite side of things, right? Are you okay with that? Because then people wonder, hey, what's wrong with you, right? Yeah. Same goes the other way around as well. When in Australia, for example, um. When people started opening, uh, when I was there, right, they started opening stores on the weekends and post five o'clock. And people asking, "What's wrong with you guys? Don't you want a balance and, and things like that?" But you know, and people start questioning and then start throwing shade at you, like, right? But if you're okay with it, you're comfortable with it, and that's a decision that you are okay making. Then by all means, go for it, like that sense. Like, what's good yeah. for you is the right thing to to do, like. Because yeah. I think in Australia it's all about being chill, but in Singapore yeah. it's all like we have to be the best at being chill. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, correct. Yeah, exactly that. Thank you. Yeah. Add one more C to their five Cs, right? <laughs> sure. I mean, everyone makes mistakes, I think, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think the key here is to learn mm-hmm. from our mistake. And I'm reading mm-hmm. Brad's um, question again. And mm-hmm. there's no point of apologizing to everyone about that mistake that you think mm-hmm. is huge. And then you make it again the next time because, yeah, you know, yeah. you have to learn from it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to and make the to sort of change the way you work or the way yeah. you do things so yeah, that yeah. you don't need to apologize to people anymore. Yeah, yeah. And also there's right? this strange effect where because you're chasing perfection, because it's always changing perfection, then the chance of you making more mistakes is going to be elevated anyway because you're just hyper-focused oh. on the wrong thing instead of actually doing the work. I want to be perfect. I want to be perfect. Then I go mess up, right? And then yeah, we're back to square one again. Mm. Oh, interesting. Mm. All right. If you have any questions, you can send it over to us. Uh, if you would like to remain anonymous, uh, you can send us a text message on our DG Lightline zero one six five one zero double eight double eight, or you can just leave your comments uh, down below on our Facebook page, uh, and we will answer it 
for you, Dr. Joel will answer it for you, not us. Because <laughs> we're not qualified. Anyways. <laughs> we have one particular question here. I think it's from our, I think it's also from a DG Lightline, if I'm not mistaken, from Najiha Bell. Do you see that one? It says, how to help a friend with a drug addiction. He does want to go to rehab and every night he's, well, he's on uh, substances. He mm. keeps pushing me away. I care a lot for him. He doesn't understand. Mm. Last week, I I threw his drugs down the drain. He got angry and called me names. Ooh, mm. so uh, I suppose it's a question on intervention, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really hard question to answer, Nigeria, because um, people who don't want to be helped are not going to be helped, now, right? Um, I think that's the unfortunate and really sad situation where friends and loved ones sometimes have to accept because you know you can like, like I keep saying on this I said this on this show many many times before right you can bring the river, horse to the river but you can't force it to bring the water right I'm sure if you ask your friend um Najira whether you know whether he knows that drugs is bad for him I'm pretty sure he can tell you the answer is yes right but the other effects of it like the high that he gets out of it the good feelings he gets out of it probably um, surpasses that like, also or, or suppresses the badness of it like in that sense right. So until he has that own recognition or realization that he should get off it and it's bad for him, I think there's precious little that we can do. I mean, I mean, look, let's say you your average um, uh, drug addict gets caught by police and gets sent to jail, for example, right? They go to jail, they get or go on detox because they don't have drugs there in the prison. What happens after that? When the instant they come out, they're looking for the next high again, right? And again, they boils down back to the fact that if they don't want to get better, they're not going to get better, right? Um, you also see a lot of this in like drug rehab centers as well, where people have relapse rates, so they're falling back on the wagon again and again and again. And again, because I go for the wrong intentions. I go because my, my girlfriend asked me to, my wife asked me to. But because I want to, I still want to keep taking it. Why should I stop? Right? There's no reason for me to stop. Lah. No internal reason for me to stop. Lah, right? So Ajira, I guess my, my answer to you is, I, I don't know. Right? Um, I think sometimes there are some situations where people just have to hit that brick wall really, really hard before they realize that, okay, I need to get help. And I think the best thing you can do is that when that day happens or when that day comes, you're there to help him out. Lah, in that sense, if you're still able to hang on in there for the friend. Lah. To get him help, I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to tell you that. Lah, I, but, you know. but like, I'm, I'm looking at it from like <clears throat> a perspective of a wife, of a mother. You know, mm. if that was my, my husband, for example, mm. or if that was my yeah. son who's taking mm. the drugs, yep. what can I do to sort of push him in the right direction to stop taking the drugs? I think the education is important, right? So making sure that they have enough information about what it's doing to their bodies, what's going to happen to them in the long run, both legally and biologically and things like that, socially as well. I think that's the extent to what we can do. Like. I mean, ultimately, if you nag at them or scold them every day, it's going to fall on their ears as well, right? So making mm -hmm. sure that they are able or they're equipped to make the best decision that they can when they are when they want to when they need to make their decision i think that's the best thing that we can do and don't get me wrong i know it's when you're when you're a loved one it's a totally different ball game there's so much more stress and worry and concern because it's my it's my son it's my daughter it's my husband it's my wife right but if you strip away that level again if your spouse if your partner if your family member does not want to listen to you what can you do Right? I mean, you hear about those more traditional stories where parents would beat the potatoes out of their kids because they're on drugs. Sure, they stop for a few weeks, they feel guilty about it, but after that, the, the bruises go away, what happens? Right? More often than not, they relapse after that. Unless there's some kind of personal epiphany that, okay, I, I don't want to disappoint my parents, I want to do better by myself and things like that. But short of that, you know, it's, it's hard. Like, it's never an easy ride. Like, it's always very difficult. I mean, and, you, you know, get things... Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, Bell. Yeah, you go. Yeah. I've Did seen this on TV before uh, of people in the West do, taking this thing called an intervention. Yeah. yeah. So all the loved ones would gather mm -hmm. around and read him or her a letter, the, the addict a letter, and say why they want that person to <laughs> rehab or, or yeah. um, you know, kill this uh, habit off. Mm -hmm. Will that work? I've never seen it here in Malaysia. I don't <laughs> know. Yeah, like, yeah. If you can, I feel like I'm ganged up though. Well, they can, they can feel like that. They can feel like that, or you could feel that you know there are people who genuinely do care about you. Again, it's a perspective kind of thing, right? It depends mm -hmm. on the person who's on receiving end. I think well, it can work because it helps them realize that you know there are people who care. They whatever I choose to do has implications on my loved ones and the people around me. 
And I think the big hope there is that that's enough to trigger them to say, okay, I'm going to look for help, right? But I think ultimately, if, again, like I said, there's not like if they really don't care about that and it's my life, my decision, I, I get to choose, then, you know, it's not going to work anyway. Mm. But I mean, it's uh, drug addiction, it's it's a big problem to solve. I mean, we can't even solve people like smoking. You know it's bad. <laughs> yeah, people know yeah, it's yeah, bad, yeah. That, you know, but they can't yeah. even stop that from mm. happening. People continue to smoke. You can make the, the most uncomfortable place for people to smoke and yet they will continue to smoke. Yeah, yeah. Correct. How do you even solve that problem and then move then move on to the drug addiction problem, right? Yeah, it's hard. They don't even say cigarettes, bubble tea. You know, we know it's leaden with sugar. Ah, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That right. one over there. <laughs> bubble tea. Bubble tea uh, queen. <laughs> Uh, but it, it, again, it's a personal choice. Like. I think ultimately, if we know we, let's say, work out and we eat healthy all five, six days of the week and on Sundays I get to have my cup of bubble tea, you know, it's okay, right? Yeah. So it's a matter of perspective and what you are willing to sacrifice, like, gifts and takes, like, right? It's when it affects your life and affects your work, then it becomes yeah. a problem. Right? Yeah, uh, and people, people around, around you as well. You as well. Yeah. It affects the people exactly. around you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Dr. Joel Lo, thank you so much for your time. And, uh, Thanks, man. This has been fun. <laughs> this is always very insightful and thank you so much for getting in touch as well hopefully we got to answer yeah, you. your questions as well uh you can keep sending in those questions as well the next time we get around to this uh, another session like this uh, we can probably get uh, dr joel to answer it as well but you can still um get all this uh, on our i suppose on on the shop app as well right bill um, you'll be able to listen to some of the questions and the answers for our Mind Matters segment on Wednesday at 8 o'clock in the morning oh, on yeah. Night Breakfast. And also, um, right after this wraps, you can still watch the Facebook Live on our Facebook page for, for yes. a long time more to come. Yeah, so if you right. missed anything, you can watch this Facebook Live again. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and for all your questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Joel, of course. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. That fun. This is a blast.